I believe I was once asked the best question in the world. It's a question that changed the way I thought about my life at the time. And it's a question that has continued to cause uh, changes um, and adjustments in my life, even to this day. I plan to ask that very same question of all of you today. I was invited here to talk about living an unlimited lifestyle. What do we mean by an unlimited lifestyle? I guess for me, that just means living a life without compromise, a life where I choose what I want to do and where day by day I pick how I want to live my life. But to talk about an unlimited lifestyle, I guess we need to look briefly at the nature of limits and the limits that we all perceive on the life that we want to live. I believe those limits come from three different areas. First of all, ourself. Secondly, our peer group. And thirdly, from society itself. How many times have you caught yourself making excuses for not doing something that you really want to do? I don't have enough time, I don't have enough money, or I have family commitments. Our peer group can hold us back too. Many of us feel the pressure of family who perhaps want us to follow in the family footsteps and be a doctor, a lawyer, a dentist, or perhaps take over the family farm. Or friends who don't want us to leave to follow our dreams uh, and, and will miss us if we, if we leave home. Society, too, places expectations upon us. We're expected to go to school, get good grades, follow on to university, start a career, climb the career ladder, get a mortgage, get married, buy the, the, the car and the carpets and all the trappings that go with it. Uh, we then have to start, if we have kids, saving for the kids' college fund and so on. Perhaps 40, 45 years later, you get to retire and that's when you get to enjoy the goals and the dreams that you've always held on to. I don't know that for me, happiness that lies down that road. How do you overcome those limits? Um, for me, as I said, I was once asked what I believe is the best question in the world. And I'm going to ask that question of you today. I'm also going to give you an extra bonus question, um, which, <laughs> which uh, has also changed the way that I live my life. But before I do that, we will get to those questions, I'd like to give you just a little bit of background and a bit of an idea on where those questions have taken me. I was born in the north of England, I had a fairly easy childhood, I did okay at school and I went to college and got a teaching degree. The subject I studied was outdoor education and I loved the outdoor lifestyle. Uh, I learned how to teach climbing and canoeing and caving, a bit of skiing, and use those skills to teach other people communication, teamwork, cooperation, that type of thing. In my 20s, I managed to actually hold down a job for just over two years, which was a personal record for quite a long time. <laughs> However, a taste for adventure um, and a need for some excitement led me to setting up my own business. On the northeast coast of England, along with a business partner, I set up a jet ski hire company. Probably not the soundest of business decisions, the northeast coast of England isn't the warmest place, and summer's pretty <laughs> short there. But we did have five awesome summer seasons, and it was a job that I really enjoyed, or a business that I really enjoyed. It was during that time that I met my wife-to-be. We married, um, and we eventually moved. Uh, one, once, after five years of the jet ski business, we sold the business, and my wife and I moved to Australia. She had an Australian mother and dual nationality, which made it very easy for us once we were married. I loved Australia, and in Australia I came across, I found my new passion, my new hobby, which was skydiving. I've always been a bit of an adrenaline junkie and enjoyed the, the adventure sports and adventure activities, but skydiving for me really upped the ante. It really is, uh, as one friend put it, the, the, the grandfather of all extreme sports, I think. Um, but in Australia, Life had different plans for me. Life wasn't to continue its happy course, um, and I discovered that my wife didn't see our marriage continuing the, its, as far as I was concerned, happy trajectory at the time. And I also discovered she'd actually implemented a couple of changes of personnel within the marriage. Um, 
it wasn't, it wasn't the happiest time of my life. It, it, it really was a, a, a dark period, and it was a deep hole that I had to dig myself out of. I decided that some changes were in order, and what I did was uh, gave up the job I was doing, uh, and spurred on by that reckless move, I did some truck driving lessons. My goal was to get into the, the lucrative mining industry in Australia. I packed some clothes into my car, and I drove out into the desert to a little mining town called Kalgoorlie, where within 48 hours, I found a place to live and a job driving this machine. <laughs> it's called a slag hauler, and it takes waste, mol molten metal from, from a, a refining plant up to a tip head. It wasn't exactly the job I wanted, but it paid well, and it gave me the credibility and experience I need, needed to get the job that I really did want, which was driving the big monster trucks in the open-cut gold mines. <laughs> this became my new office for a while. What a, what a machine that is. But during that period, I still felt I hadn't completed the, the, the moving on from, from the, the separation and the ultimate divorce. I was still living in a house uh, that was a leftover asset. I'd moved back to Perth and was living in a house that was a leftover asset from part of my life that had, had finished. The furniture and all the belongings in the house were also reminders of that part, part of my life. And I decided I needed to get rid of it all. Perhaps traveling was what I wanted to do next. So I needed to sell the house. I also needed to get rid of the car and the motorbike and the jet ski and all the furniture that, that we'd accrued, all of which were reminders of that past, past life that was now gone. Driving around in the mines, I had plenty of time to consider what I would do. And I decided perhaps I could sell the house as a furnished package. Perhaps I could include the car and the motorbike and all the other assets too. And it came to me, it was almost like a blinding flash of inspiration. Perhaps if I packaged the whole thing together, I could add in an introduction to my circle of friends, and perhaps a trial period at the, at the job too. And I could sell a complete life. And that's exactly what I did. <laughs> With a talented friend, we put together a website, a life for sale, and uh, another friend wrote a press release. He said, maybe if we're lucky, Ian, we might get you a, a, a little slot in the local paper, and if we're really lucky, we might get you a piece on local radio too. Well, we far exceeded his expectations. I appeared on TV in Australia, in America, in England. I was on radio shows in Canada and Colombia and Israel and Iceland, New Zealand, the world over. It was an absolutely crazy time. Uh, I appeared in newspaper articles and magazines too. And I even had Hollywood producers ringing me up saying, we're interested in your story. We're fascinated by what you're doing. <laughs> I had, I had one telephone call from a producer, I, I believe they were at Universal Studios, and she said, Ian, what you're doing is amazing. We see this as a Tom Hanks type of rom-com. <laughs> <laughs> and it just came straight out of my mouth without thinking. I said, no, 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 I rather saw George Clooney playing me. <laughs> and and, and without, without, uh, without picking up a, a hint of the humor that I, I thought was in my voice, she said, yeah, maybe we could make that happen. <laughs> And I thought, I, I, I've waded way out of my depth here now. Um, it was during the run-up to the auction that the, 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 the bonus question stems from. In interviews, I was asked so often, Ian, what will you do once you've sold your life? And I didn't really have an answer. I had a vague idea of travel, but I, it was something that I wanted to answer for myself. And I started to think about what I would like to do after the sale had completed. I started making lists of things I wanted to do, and anything really that excited me went, went on that list. And that's the key to the bonus question. I've been rereading a, a book by a guy called Tim Ferriss called The 4-Hour Workweek. I don't know if any of you are familiar with it. Tim Ferriss is a guy who certainly knows something about living an unlimited lifestyle. At one point in the book, he asks a seemingly simple question. He asks, what is the opposite of happiness? Hands up anyone who has the word sadness in mind now. Yeah, I see a few hands. No, says Tim. No, no. Happiness and sadness are just two sides of the same coin. Much like love and hate are two sides of the same coin too. The opposite of love or of hate is complete indifference. Much the same with happiness and sadness. The opposite of either is complete boredom. And that's the key for me 
to finding happiness. I needed to find what excited me, and that's what I've found makes me happy. It doesn't have to be the adrenaline sports, the type of thing I, I do. It doesn't have to be skydiving or running with bulls or, or swimming with whales. It can be something like learning a new language or raising money for charity or, or working with the homeless. Whatever it is for you that excites you, that, I believe, is what's going to make you happy. But the key is you have to do something about that as well. So I started creating a list of all the things I wanted to do. And as the list approached 100, I thought, that's exactly what I'm going to do next. I made a list of 100 goals, and I needed a timeline in which to achieve those. 100 months, a bit too long, I think. 100 days, far too short. Aha, 100 weeks, just right. And I set off after the auction finished to try and do all of the things I'd ever wanted to do. I did skydive. I actually did it naked. I did run with the bulls in Pamplona. It was the scariest thing I've ever done in my life, apart from perhaps today. And I did dive with whales too. I also learned a new language. I know how to speak a bit of Spanish. I raised some money for charity, and I worked in a soup kitchen on Christmas Day too. I went to Carnival in Rio. I trekked to Everest Base Camp, and I walked on the Great Wall of China. All big ticket items on anybody's bucket list. But some of the things were more personal, too. I, I learned to ride a unicycle. I had a hawk land on my hand and eat some meat. And I met one of my personal heroes, Richard Branson. I don't tell you all of this, that I did all of this, to brag. I'm just a normal guy. I used to be a truck driver. But I, what I did was I set myself some challenging goals, a tight timeline, and I stepped out of my comfort zone. And I challenge you to do the same. Find out what it is that excites you, and take that first step. That's the key to it. The first step is the hardest one. The second step is a little bit easier than that. The third step easier again. It's like skydiving. The first jump is absolutely terrifying of it. I have very little memory of what happened on the first jump. The second jump becomes easier. The third jump easier still. I'm all at almost 200 jumps now. Um, the thrill is still there, but the terror has gone. Almost. <laughs> um, and, and the skydiving brings me back, I guess, to the best question in the world. It was my skydiving instructor in the early days of skydiving that asked me that question. His name was Mossy, and we were at the bar on one Saturday night at the skydive club, where I believe more skydiving knowledge is learned than in any classroom session. Mossy said to me, Ian, I'm going to ask you a question, and then I'm going to the toilet. You've got two minutes, and I want an answer when I get back. OK, I said. I was always intrigued by what Massey had to say. Uh, he'd become a bit of a mentor to me, and he, he always had some interesting stuff. And this is what he asked me. Ian, he said, what is your life's mission statement? What is your life's mission statement? Now, I don't know if you're familiar with the phrase mission statement, but it's used by companies and businesses worldwide uh, to distill down the, the company ethos, the meaning uh, of, of why a company is in business into one or two succinct sentences. Mossy went off to the bathroom, and he came back. And when he returned, he said, Ian, do you know why I asked you that question? And I said, of course I do. I know why you asked me that. My life is more important to me than any business. And if a business deserves a mission statement, surely my life deserves a mission statement too. It doesn't really matter what my answer was, but it came to me fairly quickly and fairly easily. And thinking about that has changed the course of my life. And I challenge you to ask yourself the same question. I'm not going to walk away and give you two minutes and come back and ask for some answers. But I would like to hear some later on. Catch me later on. I'll be around for, for the rest of the day. Or even email me a couple of answers. I'd love to hear what you have to say. The results of that question have been quite startling. At the end of two years of travel, I'd achieved 93 of my 100 goals. I actually achieved a 94th one by writing a book about what I did. The movie rights were actually bought by Walt Disney Pictures. And as yet, I don't know whether it's going to be George Clooney or Tom Hanks that plays me. I'm still waiting to find out. 
With Disney's money, what did I do? I did the sensible thing. I went and bought my own little private Caribbean island, of course. <laughs> and the adventure has continued from then. Just last week, we had a, a UK documentary film crew come and spend a week on the island filming our lifestyle and, and the, the off-grid life that we, we live there. One of the things that they did was uh, assisted with building a helipad. And now I have my own helipad on my own private Caribbean island. I don't, <laughs> I don't have the helicopter yet, though. That's, <laughs> that's the next goal on the list. But in the spirit of if you build it, they will come, on the island of dreams, a helicopter did turn up. The film crew brought in a helicopter, and we got to film the island from the air. And they took me up. I got five minutes, and I got to see my own place from the air. And that's my little piece of paradise just off the coast of Panama in the Caribbean. And this adventure, really, for me, has just come from asking myself those two questions. And I challenge you to do, do the same. Let's take a quick look at the questions. The best question in the world. What is your life's mission statement? What is your life about? What is it that you were supposed to be doing? And the free bonus question, what is it that excites you? What is your passion? What's there deep in your heart that you really want to do? Take that first step. I challenge you, take that first step. And once you do that, the second step is easier. The third step's easier again. Life's supposed to be an adventure. Life's supposed to be filled with excitement and experience. I hope that by answering these two questions for yourself, you figure out what your passion is, what it is that you're meant to be doing. And I hope by answering these questions, you too can learn how to live an unlimited life. Thank you.